All right, I'm assuming my microphone is on. Um, good evening, everybody. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, students. I'm very happy to see also lots of familiar faces. Um, my name is Luisa Białosiewicz, and I'm a professor of European governance in the Department of European Studies at the University of Amsterdam. And I will be the moderator for tonight's discussion, which I hope will be a lively one. It is on a topic that you see announced here on the screen that's certainly very timely. Um, and we have a wonderful panel of experts who will help us discuss it. Um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you to De Bali for providing the space for this event and the opportunity for this discussion. And also a thank you um, for the support to the Amsterdam School for Regional, Transnational and European Studies, um, also for helping support this event. Now, um, the idea for this discussion for this evening actually was given um, by the publication of Jan Zilonka's newest book with the very provocative title, um, Counter-Revolution. And let me make sure I don't um, butcher the second part of it, Liberal Europe in Retreat. And you should have seen on your chairs the flyer for the book with a, with a kind of equally provocative cover image. Now, um, the book is an interesting, I think, book because it very much speaks also beyond an academic audience. It's written as a series of letters. As a series of letters written to a figure who many of you may know or certainly will have heard of, Ralph Darendorf, um, a great European and somebody who certainly inspired many of us, myself included, um, to become scholars of Europe. So the book, much like Darendorf's own book, which was called Reflections on Revolution in Europe, uh, but published in 1990, so after a different set of revolutions, Jan Zielonka's book, in a sense, reflects on another, um, we could say, differently revolutionary period in Europe's um, present. The illiberal counter-revolution, as he terms it, that risks perhaps disintegrating Europe. And this will be, I think, one of the points we will discuss. So before we start with actually uh, the event, I wanted to just say a couple of words regarding how we're going to structure the evening. So what we will do is we will begin with Jan's brief presentation of the book, and I will introduce him more fully at that point. Um, and you will speak for about 15 minutes or so, something like that. Um, we will then have a response and a comment um, from Matthias Locke and from Fritz Borkestein, um, who will also speak for about 10 minutes. And then I will ask all of them on stage together um, to engage in a kind of brief discussion because what we would really like to do is also hear your comments and questions. And so what I will do is you know, kind of bring people up on stage um, one by one. Um, so let me give a very quick introduction um, to Jan. Um, Jan is currently Professor of European Politics and also Ralph Darendorf Professorial Fellow at St. Anthony's College in Oxford. He has taught at the University of Warsaw, um, at the European University Institute in Florence, and also here in the Netherlands at Leiden. Um, he is the author of 17 books and countless articles. His most recent, um, before this one, with an equally provocative title is The EU Doomed. And we were just talking um, before, uh, before we're starting here about the fact that the book actually probably came out a bit too early and people were not quite convinced yet of the doom scenario or of the <laughs> claims he was making, but certainly a very timely book already then when it came out in 2014. So Jan, and I think many of you in the audience will know, is not only a key voice in... Um, contemporary European studies, but also has been a very visible um, figure and commentator in popular debates um, on the future of the EU and not only. And uh, a, a provocateur in many ways, as you yourself uh, <laughs> have, have noted. And he in fact contributes very frequently to writing editorials, op-ed op pieces on a number of European newspapers. 
Now, this most recent book is certainly a provocation of sorts. Um, so what I want to do, and literally you know, in, in two minutes, because I want to give you the floor, is I want to begin by asking you about what I think is one of the strongest claims that you make in the book. Um, and that is that, no, this is not yet another book about populism and populists, but rather, very willingly, very explicitly, a book about liberals and liberalism. Because, as you rightly argue, for all the ink and all the tears spilled in decrying um, the populist menace, liberal politicians and commentators, and here I think both academic and um, non-academic commentators, have been much less able, in a sense, to reflect critically on why the liberal project is not just no longer appealing to increasingly large numbers of voters, but indeed no longer provides the answers to today's challenges, whether economic challenges or identitary challenges. So the book is in many ways a plea for an alternative liberal project that wants to, in a sense, counter, as you say, a politics of hope uh, against a politics of fear. Now, I think many, if not most of us in the room would share your uh, plea for an alternative project. I mean, I know I certainly would. So I guess my uh, perhaps also willingly provocative question to you is how can we formulate such a project without necessarily, in a sense, formulating it against a, if we want to call it that, a populist class. A populist class that has become almost a kind of ethnographic other that one, liberals don't understand, but have to understand in order to be able to reclaim their votes. Um, And I guess a populist class, populist others also define very often, and you certainly don't do that in this book, but I think it's a great temptation, defined either in very kind of economistic or culturalist terms. So driven by job loss, precarization, you know, kind of the vagaries of the globalized economy, or driven by identitary fears, by the kind of the geopolitics of fear that you describe in one of the chapters. Now, um, I think these sorts of understandings are very problematic um, as you know, when you also kind of describe in the book, and one of the chapters is um, entitled, Why Do They Hate Liberals? The they being, you know, once more, the, the populist classes. And again, I'm, I'm willingly, you know, kind of uh, prodding you in, on, on this point because it made me think of 2008 and then, um, then presidential candidates Barack Obama's very offhand but very unfortunate comment to voters in rural Pennsylvania that has been repeated over and over again. Um, So voters who had been struggling against job losses for over 25 years, and his comment was, and many of you will remember it, well, it's not surprising that they get bitter and they cling to guns or religion or antipathy to people who aren't like them. You know, famously regretted comment. Or more recently, literally a couple of days ago, Um, Hillary Clinton noting that she only lost in backwards places. Now, European liberal politicians are a bit more savvy um, than their American counterparts. They don't refer to their electorate as deplorables or backward. But when over 50% of the electorate is written off as irresponsible or irrational, as most recently in the Italian elections, and this is both front cover of The Economist, leading light of the liberal press, but also left of center um, La Repubblica, the best-selling daily in Italy right now. With these sorts of characterizations, um, how on earth do we hope to claim this irresponsible populist class for a new liberal project? To me, that's at least, you know, uh, as a political geographer, one of my main worries. So I think I would launch you with this question. but I will let you take the discussion um, in a way that you see best fit. So, Jan, the the floor is yours. I don't know if you prefer to stand, if you prefer to sit, and then move on. Thank you, Louisa. I'm going to talk about the Netherlands here. 
20 jaar niet gesproken. Misschien later bij, bij de bar. Uh, look, first I should make a confession. I'm a liberal. I always see myself as liberal. And even if liberal is maybe doom, I will go under together with, you know, with the whole group. So, um, so if I'm critical about liberals, it's, it's, about, it's, it's criticism about people like myself. Uh, yes, I never been close to power, but uh, I socialized a lot with those in power. In fact, with Fritz Bockenstein, we just remember we first had uh, our meeting during Cold War in here in, in cafe. Uh, and your concert about. Uh, so it's, it's a critical book about people like myself, the generations of, of those who believe that Europe could be without walls, that, that in Europe we can combine freedom with social justice, that international relations is not about uh, cluster uh, bombs, but about diplomacy, multilateralism, and that Europeans, after all these horrible wars, can work together and build something special. Well, and at a certain moment, I thought the dream came true. In 1989, I came to Holland as a refugee. You know? And then, a few years later, the Berlin Wall collapsed, and as Bill Clinton said, you know, everything is possible. And it looked like uh, liberalism will run, at least Western world, forever. It was the only game in town. Well, you know where we are now. I mean, in countries which I know very well because I, I actually live physically there, in Great Britain, there's a culture war after Brexit, and in Poland, you know what the government is doing. You read newspapers, I don't have to tell you, and, and in recently in Italy, the center-left, center-right parties were smashed, and those new kids on the block with illiberal versions of, of policy just took, took it all. Look at the map of, uh, of elections. Lega North, North, Cinque Stelle, South. And if liberals manage to stay in power, like in this country, or in Austria, and even in France, I would argue, they stayed because they adopted a lot of populist rhetoric and policies. And you can ask the question, how much of those illiberal ornaments can liberalists survive? So I don't think it is going very well for liberals. So I'm a little bit angry. And this is why I wrote this book. And I basically argued that it is not that those populists are so brilliant, so charismatic, so visionary. No. They are so strong because we are so weak. Because if you look at our record over those three glorious decades of liberal reign, which means center-left, center-right party, not just party with the liberal in the title, right? Well, these were not populists in power when inequality catapulted. Inequality is catapulted. I mean, today everybody knows Piketty or so, but it didn't come from the sky. These were not populists in power when financial sectors were basically deregulated and all public authority was, it was basically described as redundant. And then when those f uh, banks uh, uh, produced crash, ordinary taxpayer um, was asked to pay for this, which made both creditor, creditor and debtor countries unhappy. 
Liberals were, uh, populists were not in power when we invaded other countries without UN mandate. And what is worse, we let them rot in the hands of warlords. And then we were surprised that there are refugees coming from those countries. Hmm? And you can go on and on. And this is rather long. And I was surprised that the voters started to look for alternatives? Well, I'm not. They were pretty patient. We preached one thing, I've done another. And there were always good excuses. There were always good excuses. I remember the most shocking example, you know, when, when the Polish government was asked to pay compensations for people who tortured and in CIA camp in, in, in Poland, uh, all my liberal friends were furious. They said, of course we're against torture, but alliance with Americans, but of course they are terrorists. Well, I see here the ghosting who spent all his life in, in Amnesty International. Are they good excuses? We've all preached that. And the and, and this counter-revolution comes from different, in different forms and shapes because there are different local circumstances. Greece economy contracted 25%, Polish economy con grow, grew 25% over the last decade. So of course the manifestation is very local. How, you know, Tsipras, you can say, cannot be compared to Kaczynski. You know, one is anti-Russian, the other is a friend of Russia. One is a former Marxist, the other fought all his life against Marxists. One is in favor of human treatment of refugees, the other just doesn't want to, to see any refugees, he probably never saw in his life. But they have one thing in common. They're against the basic principle of liberal order. All the pillars, liberal democracy, European integration, open borders, uh, humanitarian intervention, and all the, the, you know, some of those people go even further. The Polish former foreign minister even castigated those who are cyclists, who are vegans, who are environmentalists. He said, I don't want to have anything to do with those people. They were ruling us much too long. Why this is like this? Because you see, the problem is that liberal ideas, which used to be ideas of those oppressed against powerful kings at the time, and then later power, you know, after war, you know, totalitarian rule, they have been transformed in, in something much more cozy. Liberalism became a system which defined the notion of normality and rationality. It has become ideology of power. So it is not just about migration. It is not just about austerity. It, nor is it only about genderism, you know? Something what the Polish peace hates most. Genderism is for them much more dangerous than neoliberalism. <laughs> it is about the package and the people who represent them. And what we do, we either side, with, we, re, we kind of play soft populist note, if you're on the right, or perish, as social democrats in this country and many others. Yeah? But the common thing among our circus, and here I finish, is that we, we were first instead of looking to in the mirror, we started to blame voters. We said, oh, those people voting populist might be mad or misled. We can spend hours talking about populists, but we rather not talk about ourselves and our record. And I don't expect from, you know, I don't study populists, by the way, some terrific Dutch Scholars study populists like Kas Mude, my former friend from Leiden. This is a very good work, but I, I'm not interested in them. 
I, I don't think they are so interesting. They are so powerful. You know, uh, Pepe Grillo, if you know Italian, can be funny. But most of them, this is a third, fourth sort of uh, political class. I don't expect them to tell us how to re reform democracy or markets. I expect from us to tell us, but I don't see any answers. Zero. And we can talk about this later. That is the most frightening, that if you ask me, do we have any idea how to make people feel that they vote counts? How to basically regain somehow of public authority of the markets? How to make un the European Union finally to adopt uh, some reforms to bring it closer to citizens? Zero. We now try to dig ourselves in the hole and, and, and protect everything what, what, what we still have. Well, I don't think this is the way for liberals to bounce back. And therefore, I'm not so optimistic. And therefore, I wrote rather this sour book about guys like me who got it wrong. And I'm one of them. I also at times justify things I shouldn't. So this is not about politicians only. It starts with intellectuals. It starts with intellectuals. Because here I see the, the greatest weakness. I don't expect from politicians to have a new paradigm of, 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 of markets running, uh, being run in, in the 21st century. The only thing I hear is to kind of uh, reheat it Keynes uh, idea. Yeah? I see Cinque Stelle or Podemos experimenting with e-democracy. I don't see liberals doing this. I'm not even talking about the European Union because with friends like Junkers or Tajani, you know, <laughs> I don't know how much you can <laughs> hope for any change. Yeah? One is a symbol of tax dodging, the other was spokesman of Berlusconi covering all his uh, misdeeds uh, early. Everybody who knows uh, uh, how Italian politics work, you know, and, and now he's president of the European Parliament, elected only a few months ago. And Mr. Tusk, who prides himself on not having vision, he said, if you have a vision, go to a doctor. Well, we will have a lot of reforms then. So what I want to say is that, that this is something what we ourselves should address. It will take time. It is not going to be done by decree. It, we need to invent new paradigms and not just, you know, quick fixes. It is Berlusconi who in recent weeks was going from television to television saying, flat tax, flat tax. You will introduce all problems of Italy will be gone. Happily, Italians didn't trust this. <laughs> no, it doesn't work this way. And therefore I expect a lot time will pass before it gets better. So take your seat belts because it will be turbulent for some time. Thank you, Jan. So on, on that cheery note, <laughs> um, I'd like to um, join, call to join us on the stage a colleague from uh, also the Department of European Studies, um, Dr. Matthias Locke, who is actually an intellectual and political historian. 
and has written um, extensively on histories of conservatism, illiberalism, and all kinds of other counter-revolutions <laughs> um, in Europe's past. And um, we've asked Matthias to provide, a, let's say, historical context and comment on what is happening today, and of course on, on Jan's book, also because we thought it was important, not just of course to have that historical context, but to understand, let's say, the that the exceptionality, that the crisis nature of the current moment is perhaps not so exceptional. So, Matthias, I don't know if you want to take the podium or... Um Thank you, uh, Louisa. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the lessons from the past. And in the past, you can look for... Uh, uh, you can find despair and hope as well. So I have a little bit of both in my uh, short historical <laughs> comment. Don't worry, this will not be a lecture, just short comment. Uh, in his essay, the and I'm sorry, I'm going to read it a little bit because uh, I'm, uh, I cannot speak that freely as, as, uh, as, as you yourself can. Uh, in his essay, uh, and I'm sure you've not all read it, so that's the shorter sh summary, um, Counter-Revolution, Liberal Europe in Retreat, Professor uh, Zilonka discusses the current rise of anti-liberalism in Europe and the development he terms counter-revolution. And the counter-revolution aims to undermine the liberal order, you explained it, um, uh, and you will say that the lack of democracy, the rule of experts, insufficient attention to security, the dominance of neoliberal economics, and the failure of a common European migration policy, among many other reasons, uh, rather than evil populist leaders, are the true cause of the current predicament of the liberal order. Um, Silonka, uh, um, and for you, I think liberalism uh, has to renew, it, renew itself. And I think of what I've read in your book, uh, you see uh, a future uh, and more focus on social, uh, against social inequality, uh, pluralism, um, and democratic renewal. Uh, Professor Silonka proudly claims not to be a historian, but a political observer. And professors not only to look at history in order to do, be able to say something about the future. Nonetheless, he has chosen the work of an older work, the essay by his mentor, Ralph Darendorf, on the 1989 revolution as a model. Darendorf himself was inspired by Edmund Burke's book Reflections on the Revolution in France in 1789. I think Siloga, however, differs in many ways from Burke. The Anglo-Irish Whig, Whig politician, of course, was a pro proponent of the counter-revolution, regarding revolutionary France as a danger to the freedom and moderate rule guaranteed by historically built institutions, European institutions, and as the embodiment what he terms the spirit of conquest. For Burke, as for other 18th century counter-revolutionaries, revolutionary politics based on popular participation would lead to despotism and anarchy. I think it's a very interesting reversal of sides that the 21st century counter-revolution, as uh, uh, identified by Professor Silonka, uh, is based on the legitimacy of the supposed will of the people, whereas the revolutionaries of eight, 1989 mainly consist of a new aristocracy of academics, bankers, consultants, and other self-proclaimed experts. In this sense, there's a real interesting reversal of the old counter the first counter-revolution and the one identified, uh, which is happening now. In his Esra, Zilonka reminds me not of the fiercely rhetorical Burke, but instead of the early 19th century liberal Benjamin Constant, actually, a Swiss nobleman, uh, a lover of Madame de Staal, many other love affairs, but I'm not sure whether there's a comparison there. Um, and like Zulonka himself, Benjamin Constant wandered through Europe uh, for a large part of his life in a great era of turmoil, the era of the revolution and its aftermath. And like Zilonka, Constant's, Constant's project was to reinvent liberal politics after the dramatic effects and of the revolutionary de decade. The liberal revolution of 1789 had, of course, ended dramatically in the first bloody terror of the year 1792, followed by the instable and corrupt directorate, and finally in the dramatic rise and fall of the authoritarian Napoleonic Empire and the restoration of the Bourbon monarchy. In fact, compared to 1789, I would say, the liberal elites of 1989 revolution did perhaps did not so badly after all. Constant wanted to go back to the liberal ideas of the early revolution. Um, he felt that the power of the state should be curbed and individual liberty protected against a despotic state, while at the same time advocating political participation of the citizens. Liberalism for Constant, I think a wonderful speech about the ancients and the moderns, I think it's very, can be a huge inspiration for, I would say, 21st century liberals. 
of course, I'm selling history here. That's my profession. So, um, but I think uh, uh, liberalism for Constant was not only for protecting individual rights, but also the moral development of citizens as part of a modern and commercial society. I think also there's another last comparison, like Constant, uh, Zilonka, uh, they're both against dogmatic liberalism and propagated a modern individual idea of freedom. But this is not a lecture about the French Revolution, don't worry. In many ways, I will come to more contemporary uh, aspects. In many ways, I would say I would agree with uh, Zilonka's uh, clear analysis of the cur current affairs in Europe. However, my view, I think, is more successful in pointing out what went wrong than really to provide an alternative for the future development of liberalism. Like Constance's liberalism, Zilonka's idea of a pluralistic, moderate, and rational liberalism, I think, will appeal above all to a certain class of well-educated professionals, probably here present. The Dutch desist voter, I suspect. In this respect, we can also learn from the past. In many ways, the criticism leveled at the French revolutionaries by Edmund Burke can also be applied to Zilonka's ideal of a rational, moderate, and pluralist li liberalism. Burke had argued that the French revolutionaries ignored the emotional and aesthetic as part of politics. Famous, and I'm sure you all know it, famous is the passage in the Reflections where Burke describes the impression made on him by the French queen Marie Antoinette. Of course, he did not end well. Um, and this was not a rational impression. This was the aesthetic, emotional, impression made by this queen, which cannot be explained by rational politics. It's emotional, it's aesthetic. And of course, he was pleading for the return of chivalry in the modern age. And in my view, Silonka's liberal project, I think, is perhaps too cerebral, cerebral and appeals too little to emotions and irrational feelings, such as loyalty and romantic longing for a higher meaning. Well, let's return to the 19th century again. Of course, this is my field. The classical age of liberalism. In my view, the reason that 19th century liberalism could become the dominant political ideology in Western Europe in the 19th century is that it allied itself the larger goal that could appeal to the emotions, in this case, the nation. And I'm not saying we should do this again in the 21st century, but that's what liberalism did in the, especially the early 19th century. In the early 19th century, liberalism, cosmopolitanism, and nationalism went hand in hand, something we find very difficult to understand now. Um, so that, that, I think that's an interesting case study to study, that you can combine cosmopolitanism, nationalism, and liberalism at the same time. And uh, that I think combining liberalism with a higher meaning was part of the success of, uh, of liberalism in the, in the 19th century. Another difference between Zilonka and his 19th century predecessors, I think, is also their use of the European past. Although Zilonka starts his book with references to Burke, he hardly discusses the role of history and memory, and especially if in his... Uh, almost forward-looking liberal project. History seems to have been left to the counter-revolutionaries. I think this is very dangerous, leaving history to the counter-revolution, to the nationalists. I think this narrows history. And of course, um, I think he differs very much from other 19th century uh, uh, liberals like François Guizot, who wrote a book on, um, on, on uh, demonstrating that liberty and individualism were already present in European history from the start, and that it was the counter-revolutionaries. Um, uh, uh, um, of course, and th th those were the conservatives who went against history and saying that what individualism, liberty, is the European uh, tradition par excellence. And I think we should go, we could go back to that. And I think also as the political scientist from Princeton, uh, Jan Werner Müller has pointed out, history and memory are very important political weapons which can be used to legitimize, legitimate as well as undermine political authority and to build collective identities as well as destroying them. Furthermore, although Zilonka refers often to social injustice, I think you, you're very clear about it, the dangers of social in injustice, the hijacking of liberalism by the neoliberal Jacobins, and the need of liberals to address socioeconomic equalities, I think what I'm missing is, the great word I'm really not missing in your book is social democracy. I'm missing social democracy. In many ways, I would say what your plan is very much about a, a, a moderate social democracy. I find, for instance, in the work of Tony Judd, which I uh, admire, um, Tony Judd, social democracy is, I think, all about curtailing capitalism for state interference. And I know social democracy is very old-fashioned, but I still have some hopes about Well, anyway. Um, but I think still social democracy should not be, isn't that not what you're, ri what you're writing about? Do social democracy and Zilonka's brand of liberalism not share the ideals of moderation, 
reasonableness and a search for a compromise. Also, Sri Lanka is, I think, rather dismissive of the na national state. But so far, as at least what I understand, national states are the only form of governance that has, has been able, capable in the past, of seriously uh, of serious wealth distribution. I think you very much admire uh, city governments. It, it looks very modern, the age of the city. But like, so far, cities have been really unable to, to counter this growing inequality and this whole pushing away of uh, um, lower middle classes and, lower, um, and, and uh, middle classes outside the city. I would say city governments are to blame for that. But we can uh, debate about it. I think you're far too optimistic about cities. Uh, we're, we're much too rosy about them. I think we're when it comes to wealth distribution. And think, uh, um, I think attempts to make liberalism again relevant and attractive, we should look to nurses, teachers and policemen, and policewomen, of course, who struggled in the past decades with the relative decreasing salaries in relation to the rising cost of living in the cities, as well as the loss of status and professional independence as a result of the new rules of the managers, of course, these evil managers, and they will not talk about the managers at our department, they'll not do that, uh, uh, and the consultants that have accompanied, uh, accompanied the liberal revolution, of course, you pointed it out. And perhaps a last, I think also a bit of a crucial, but also a bit strange, um, uh, uh, remarkable omission, I think, in, in your book, I've been asked to comment on it, I think it's also that uh, what I find missing is also the stories of migrants. You talk a lot about the refugee crisis and how it impacted uh, um, Europe, and I would agree with that. But I think the future, one of the most important future audiences of this liberal renewal project are the, are the descendants of those uh, uh, who, who had families coming outside of Europe and other parts of the frontiers of, of Europe. I think in my view, liberalism holds many appeals to young migrants who li would like to be regarded primarily as individuals rather than as exponents of a specific religious and ethnic group. And I think at the same time, and I'm becoming even more controversial, at the same time, liber liberalism itself has to adapt to new contexts and perhaps reconsider sacred ideas concerning the role of religion in the public space, for instance. But that would be really controversial, I guess. Um, conclusion. I agree with Professor Zelonka's very intelligent, uh, uh, profound analysis of the current problems of European society, and also find your ideas of liberalism also deeply sympathetic. But I'm not quite convinced we have already found the solutions, although, of course, I do not possess them here either. I would be a politician and not uh, a mere academic if I would know these uh, solutions. My suggestion here is seriously to start earlier forms of liberalism and their older discontents finding inspiration in all the liberal writers such as Benjamin Constant, Madame de Staël, uh, and many others. And I think you're France, uh, especially the French tradition, but uh, um, also the early critics of, of, of liberalism. Of course, the 19th century was also a liberalism, indeed, of criticism of liberalism. And perhaps also lessons could be learned from the liberal revolution, not of 1789 or 1989, but 1848. I think the failure of the liberal revolutions in most European cities in 1848, and that was very much a city revolution, uh, with the exception of course of Russia and England, led to the rise of a new authoritarian leadership of Napoleon III and Bismarck in Germany, who founded their, I think, modern, essentially modern authoritarian government on the idea of popular consent to a large extent. I think not entirely dissimilar from the current political leadership of Trump, Erdogan and Putin. And I want to end, perhaps uh, ironically, with Karl Marx. As Karl Marx wrote in his book on the French Revolution of 1848, and of course he wrote a lot about counter-revolution too, as he wrote about the revolutions of 1848 and the rise of Napoleon III, another reflection on the liberal, failed liberal revolution in Europe, of course, as Karl Marx said, history repeats itself, first as a strategy and finally as a farce. And thank you. For uh, uh, this is the, uh, yes, th 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 those are my comments. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Matthias. Have a seat. Thanks, thanks so much, and thank you for giving us, I think, a much-needed historical context. I can't say if this was, you know, really glimmers of optimism, but... Um, so I would like to call to the stage our um, last discussant for tonight, um, Fritz Volkestein, who many of you will know very well. Um, he has been a very long-serving member of 
the Dutch Parliament. Um, you're a member, actually, leader of the Dutch Liberal VVD Party for, I believe, almost 20 years. And many of you also know him for his role as European Commissioner um, under the Prodi presidency. Um, perhaps also not, not um, let's say, pleasantly known in some parts, including my own Italy. So um, <laughs> uh, unfairly, I think, uh, known for the directive that his name was um, associated with. So we're very fortunate that you have agreed to join us tonight. And um, thank you very much for accepting this invitation. If you would be willing to give some of your own comments on, let's say, Jan's book, um, but also, I think, uh, you know, kind of a broader consideration on liberalism's future and its uh, potential, please. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, I'm grateful to the Bali for letting me meet Professor Jan Zilonka again. Again, because we met many years ago at the time of the Cold War. I seem to recall that we were in agreement on the various peace movements, which I at least thoroughly disliked. Let us see whether we can come together on what Professor Zilonka calls the liberal project. For a start, what is that, the liberal project? Professor Zilonka may well say, free trade, democracy, cultural tolerance, and religious neutrality. Are these political elements under attack? Yes, in China, perhaps also in India and Indonesia. President Trump doesn't seem to like free trade, nor do the French. In fact, the French don't like liberalism at all. And that is because they don't like competition outside, of course, uh, the uh, educational system. In Northwest Europe, there you will find liberalism. But in Scandinavia, the socialist imprint is much heavier. So we must be careful with our definitions. Where does the attack on liberalism come from? It comes from populism. Professor Zilonka does not define populism. That is a pity, in particular because the term is often employed for something we all should hate. There's also, says Professor Zilonka, a soft version of populism, a soft version of populism. And Professor Zilonka here mentions Mark Rutte, Emmanuel Macron, and Theresa May. I have some difficulty in calling these politicians populists, hard or soft. According to Professor Zilonka, populism is in vogue because liberals have discredited their noble project. And here he mentions a list of liberal faults, which he says is long and worrying. Inequalities increased, social spending was cut, tax dodging became widespread. Let me not make the impression of thinking that all is for the best in, that all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Of course, there are many problems and many things that go wrong. There always are. All the result of liberalism, not of socialism, nor of nationalism, Professor Zilonka mentions the debt-ridden countries of Southern Europe. Where do those debts come from? They are caused by the, the European Monetary Union, which Italy and Greece should never have joined. Professor Zilonka calls this, uh, quote, a mockery of the liberal ideal of economic freedom. No, it is not. It is the result of bad policies, of atrocious management. Liberalism has nothing to do with it. Professor Zilonka says that, I quote, vote does not amount to voice in liberal democracies. That is an old topic. 
liberals do not like direct democracy. They prefer representative democracy. This matter was definitively settled more than 200 years ago by the English philosopher Edmund Burke in his letter to the electors of Bristol. So liberals dislike referenda. Would Professor Zilonka advocate its use of referenda? Professor Zilonka castigates liberals in international politics. He says countries have been invaded without a UN mandate. By liberals? Prisoners have been tortured, again, by liberals? He says, think about the liberals' response to the Arab Spring. Well, what should liberals have done? How should they have looked upon the, uh, the Arab Spring? I agree with Professor Zilonka about the EMU, which in its present form should never have been set up. I don't agree with him on Schengen, which he calls, let me quote, an effective and ethical system of handling migration. No, that is not Schengen. Schengen is to facilitate travel between the EU member states. Professor Zilonka indicates that the deal with Turkey about migrants is unethical. Can he tell us how we should handle the many thousands of migrants who want to settle in Europe, and particularly from Africa? Professor Zilonka castigates liberals for giving priority to freedom over equality. This, again, is an old issue. But where he says freedoms, freedoms, plural, freedoms have been granted only to a few, usually with proper credit cards and passports, end of quote, I must admit that he has lost me. Even though he says that, quote, these priorities must be reversed or else liberalism will perish. Liberals need to reinvent European integration, says Professor Zilonka. He wants cities, regions, NGOs, and firms to play a meaningful institutional, institutional role. I have worked five years as a member of the European Commission trying to get agreement among 28 member states about the internal markets. And I know how difficult that is. If all these other actors are to put in their bit of wisdom, I'm afraid only chaos will result. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, please. So if I may ask you, Jan, perhaps to respond to your two commentators and then perhaps um, open it up to both Fritz and Matthias to, for any final comments, and then we will turn it over to you. So I don't know if you, you want to launch in with some direct replies to those two comments. No, I um, <laughs> basically, I think I was vindicated writing this book, um, particularly by Fritz Bockerstein, because he confirmed that liberals do not want to look at the mural and basically glorify the, the liberal reign. And the liberal warfare. Reign, rule. Yeah. And, uh, In this country. Well, well, you're talking about which country I'm when writing, you talk about liberal rule? I'm writing about Europe. I'm not writing about very specific country. But I want to point out that that even in Germany, which is one of the few still functional countries, because some of those European states are only nominal states, is Greece sovereign state? Is Cyprus a state? <laughs> you know, so we have to be careful here, right? We come back later to the cities. Um, so even in a country like Germany, which earned a lot of money on this so-called crisis, and which has very strong government institution, uh, you have now nearly 60, no, not nearly 100 members of parliament from IFD. So 
you can say this is nothing, uh, but I remember a few years ago in Italy, when uh, Cinque Stelle entered the parliament, people were saying, oh, they will never come to the government. And, uh, and Lega Nord is a minor partner of Berlusconi, and things have changed. I remember recently in Austria, uh, where we celebrated and Van der Bele won presidential elections, and now we have government with, again, a former Haida party, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and prime minister who is speaking not much differently than them. But do you call all these people so, liberals? Yeah, well, Mr. Wurz will call himself a liberal, and, and certainly you wouldn't, if he would feel insulted, if you would call him illiberal. Yes, but but can I? Five star yeah. movement yeah. in Italy, is that a liberal movement? No, it's, uh, it's anti liberal, obviously. Well, exactly. It's obviously anti liberal. I'm saying to you that, you know, my question to you is very simple. If it is so good, why is it so bad? If what is so good? No, if, it's, if the liberal record is so basically only with some minor criticism, but basically we've done all the right things, and only some of those countries were responsible in the south and go and and, and, and got it wrong. But otherwise, you know, a liberal uh, uh, heritage is 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 very upbeaten. Why all these illiberal politicians are, are, are getting more and more votes in the ballot box? But they are not liberals. You call them liberals, but they aren't. But who you are talking now about? Well, I don't know. What, who are you talking about? <laughs> the, the Italian party is like Five Star Movement. It's not a liberal party. Well, when did I say that they are liberal party? Well, where do you say that the liberals went wrong? No. The liberals were, were, were center-left and center-right party. It was a party of Renzi. It was a party of Berlusconi. It was a party, you know, and, and smaller party like, like, uh, 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 like offsprings of those two. These were liberals, at least they called themselves liberals. Yeah, they although. called themselves, but they weren't. Partito Democratico was yeah. not liberal? There are no liberal politicians in Italy. There are no liberal politicians in France. So where do you find all these liberal politicians in Europe? They aren't. There. Well, then you have a very peculiar definition of, of liberalism. Yes, well, perhaps I do. Uh, yes, I think this is what we differ. I, I, I believe your definitions of liberalism is only, you know, the party which you led for some time. I, you know, that is fine. But most of those politicians would call themselves a liberal politicians of certain left, center, right. They would have certainly claimed the label, and yeah. I think, you know, in a sense, we, we need to take them at that claim and i think the you know the question is so what has happened why you know whether they you know there there, there may is, be disagreement there a, whether there is they're a british liberal party there is a german liberal party there is a dutch liberal party where else do you find them not in poland macron macron could be considered no, no. well that's what could could be considered but he isn't He's no, but, a nationalist. No, but but the, the point here is different. You see, my definition for liberalism was different. It was not a party with the, le with the name liberal. This is a small party with the exception of Holland. They could hardly be the leading force of any government in Western Europe. I defined liberalism the way Darendorf defined. This is a center-left and center-right party which subscribe to basic, basic tenets of liberal uh, ideas, which, which are free market, uh, uh, open borders, European integration, uh, uh, multiculturalism. Uh, uh, this, this is a set of ideas which was embraced by all mainstream center-right, center-left parties. What's the difference between social democracy, then? No, it's no. missing in your book. It's, uh... Well, social democracy was part of this. Social, but I. I didn't want to say that liberal ideas were only owned by social democrats, like I didn't want to say that they're only owned by those who call themselves liberal parties. I believe that all Christian democratic parties, or in some countries called center-right popul uh, uh, popular parties, and social democratic parties, and liberal parties, although they, they represent a small family, 
for the last 30 years, they basically subscribed themselves to the basic tenets of liberal, uh, liberalism. And I called them liberal, and they would call themselves liberal. If you would call Mr. Renzi illiberal, he would feel insulted. But if you call social democratic parties liberal, they will be very insulted. No. Well, in this no. country, they would. Wim no. Kok, Wim Kok would, uh, and you see, of course. You cannot call <laughs> social democratic parties no. liberal. Well, they are liberal. Well, then we discuss, then we yeah. differ on, and, and in of the course, definitions. In different countries, you know, these, these names formally have been attached differently. In America, liberals are Democratic Party. Here, liberal parties these days, it used not to be when we met first time, is a conservative party. Eh? Uh, so, of course, those images, but what I try to say, that liberal ideas were basically adopted by, by different parties from center-left, center-right for the last 30 decades. And they had differences, but minor. The real problem today in Europe, as I see it, is not between left and right, but between those who see themselves as liberal and those who be openly, increasingly, call themselves illiberal, and proudly so, starting with Viktor Orban, but others are following, yeah? This is what I try to describe, yeah? And of course, if you say liberal parties are only those who have in the title liberal, uh, then, of, then we are talking about small sect of, of, of political spectrum, which uh, is important for the life of people who, who are inside, but not from those who look at, at politics from outside. But I, I spoke too long because, because we should actually have a look at history too. Because in history, uh, these things evolve also with time, yes. yeah? Mm. Also with time. And I defined very cle clearly at the very beginning who I see as a liberal. And we can, of course, discuss this definition doesn't work but then we will spend all the evening on definition. This is not what we want to do. Do you want to add to that, Matthias, in terms of you know, who can claim the label of liberalism? No, but it's an interesting thing about liberalism that it keeps reinventing itself. That's sort of what liberalism does. It, 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 that's, I think, the hopeful side for uh, liberals, that it, it always comes back and it, it, it reinvents itself. I think but one of the things we should, I think, in your topic, I think, well, uh, people from migrant populations, uh, um, Oh, um, maybe you should go to the... <laughs> I'm not a politician. You, you don't have to. You're, uh, you're here uh, as a historian. Yes, but, uh, but, uh, but I found that this whole re reaction, counter-reaction, liberalism, counter-liberalism, but the problem is also about definition. That's, that's really a huge problem, how liberalism has different meaning in the Netherlands and, and in England and in the US, everywhere. That's, most of the discussion is always about what is a liberal. But the good side about liberalism is it, it re keeps reinventing itself and it, it, after every moment. So that's the... But I think France has a liberalism too. And that, that, <laughs> you that's what we're more far now. That's all we bunch of your stuff. When you find liberalism in France, no, where is it? That's what I... That was my talk. That was my... Uh, oh. Oh, I don't know. Do, you, do you want to defend the French? I would defend the Italians' ability to be liberal, not <laughs> perhaps in the current moment. But I think, you know, beyond the labels, I think what is at stake now is, as you point out in your book, and you certainly made clear in your comments, the abandonment of these, you know, values, principles, whatever we choose to call them, that whether under a social democratic rubric or a liberal rubric, were pretty much shared in the post-war, certainly post-1989 um, decades. And I think that's the question, is what has happened and what we can offer. I mean, can we offer liberalism in a new sauce, a new liberal project? Or does that word entirely have to be, you know, and in that sense, definitions matter. Does it have to be abandoned? Not its you know, basic principles that you're talking about, but certainly the rubric, the label. Um, Maybe they have we have here. exactly, yeah. but you know, we I we wanted this to be a discussion and not a lecture, as uh, several of us mentioned. So, what we'd like to do is just open the floor the floor up now to your questions, comments. There is a microphone going around, um, so we would just kindly ask you to say your name and whatever you want us to know about you. So, identify yourself in some fashion. It doesn't have to be party affiliation or whether you're a liberal or not. Your choice entirely. Go ahead. Oh, 
Um, hello, um, my name is uh, Sam. There's nothing much to say. Um, I have a definition question, and I have a definition question about the Netherlands. Because um, we have one big party that identifies itself as liberal, which is your party, Mr. Bolkestein, the VVD party. However, what I have seen the VVD party doing the past years is not being open about migration, it's not being open about the EU, it's not willing to spend more money on the EU, it's closing its borders for refugees, it's maybe even spying on its citizens with cyber law. How is that liberal? And is this party not conservative? And my question is, why is a, a party that uh, pub like makes itself public as liberal actually conservative? And do they believe this themselves? And is actually maybe not the biggest attack on liberalism from liberalism itself in that case? Is the question, <coughs> sorry, uh, is the question put to me? Yeah. Well, what's the question? Why is the party presenting itself as liberal, why to me it's very conservative, and I find as a voter that very confusing. Well, um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I don't represent uh, my party. Uh, and we're talking here about Professor Zilonka and his somewhat confused ideas about <laughs> the future of liberalism. We're not discussing my party, uh, and if you want to continue talking about my party, we'll meet at the bar. But yeah, Jan, would you like to say no, something about no, how I, liberal parties actually espouse the liberal ideas? No, but, but I think this is, this is exactly what we are talking about. Mr. Bolkestein tried to, to, to monopolize the name liberal, but then doesn't like to acknowledge that most of policies which he sees under this liberal, liberal level are anti-liberal. Uh, this is exactly the problem. And, 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 and uh, let's say with friends like this, you don't uh, rebuild liberal ideas, I would say. This is one of my arguments like book. Now, I know that he doesn't, uh, 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 you see, what, what, what I find it very rather troubling is that the definition that liberal ideas apply to only how should I put it? Not even Protestant, uh, you said, you know, only you said Northern European, but not Scandinavian, right? I never said that. Oh, how, what, what is the def geographic definition you have? I don't know where you want yeah. to look if you talk about liberal politicians. Is it, is it, is it, is it are they in Germany? Are they, they're not in Italy. The Partito Liberale and the Malagodi had 3% of, of, of the total votes. So where are, we, where are these liberals? Are they in Scandinavia? No. In Scandinavia, you find social democrats. Are they in Germany? A small party. Um, so, so where should we, where should we look if we if we talk about liberal politicians? If I would ask here the audience, you know, you tell, we, tell we, yourself, no, no, say it but, yourself. But we, you know, I never was member of a liberal party, and I consider myself liberal. That's something entirely different. You find liberals everywhere. Yeah but you don't find institutional liberals. You're talking about institutions. Oh. You don't find institutional liberals. Look, I don't. So there's one there and then in the front. My name is Herman van Gunster. If we can leave aside for a moment the definition question. If I understand Jan Zilonka well, he says that the parties that have been in power, center-left, center-right, and different coalitions, that they have pursued policies that can be heavily criticized, like the, the uh, monetary union, or also that intellectuals who engage, like, like uh, Michael Finatiev, who at the time after 9-11, he started redefining the boundaries of what counts as torture. So he criticized the, the policies of uh, the parties and the intellectuals around them that have been in power. And then his idea is that if they would have had more sensible or just policies, that we would have less of AFD and other what is called populist parties and, and disaffection with, um, with the citizens. 
So he poses a, a strict uh, relation between the quality of the policies of the reigning groups and people who turn away from politics or want a different politics. And then we can, we can go on about the definition, whether it's it, Yekwin called this global, the Davos uh, OECD consensus, or the, whether you call them liberals, but the, the, it's, it's the ruling ideas and the ruling groups. And they have not done well in, in your vision. But what is the relation with the voters who vote for other parties that some people fear? Yes. Yes, okay. Well, there you are. <laughs> People look for alternatives. And, and, and they look for alternatives partly because of mistakes, but partly because, indeed, however you call them, parties in power in Europe, had those uh, blind spots which you indicated very well. I, I agree with, with what you said. I, and, in fact... You know, I tackle um, the question, the kind of uh, the weakness to recognize communities rather than just individuals in all the thinking. And, and, and this was a famous communitarian critique by liberals themselves, in, liber, liberal intellectuals themselves, like, like, uh, like Walzer, for instance, or, or Sandelia. Uh, or, or, or Selznick, you know, they, they, they already said, you know, that oh, it is fine that, that, that to think about abstract individuals defined by roles, but people live in communities in certain, uh, uh, on certain territories, and they have these cultural bonds or religious associations which liberals feel uncomfortable with, yeah, because they find them really... Uh, defining group identities again constraining freedoms of individuals. So nation is of course one of those uh, communities but you can go through others. Yeah. So here in this country religion became a very important topic, right? So, so of course, yes, uh, these were not uh, kind of conscious policies to which neoliberal, neoliberal economics was a conscious policy of deregulation, privatization, and, and so on, right? But here, you, 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 you may say that those, the, those elites in power, however you call them, uh, they simply neglected. There was a blind spot for them. Now... I still don't know how you go around these, these communities of, of fight, so to speak, of faith. Yeah? I still don't know. Uh, I, uh, you know, this idea of, 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 of nations which will be cosmopolitan is rather difficult, and we see it in Europe today very clearly. But uh, yes, they, are, they rally around those communities because they, they feel that, that, that the majorities on certain territories have been somehow neglected. Yeah. But I don't think here, historically speaking, that we are just going back to the future. And here comes the state and nations and the city. You see, I, I, you know, we still believe that nation states are the driving force and in fact those who who are unhappy with with European community or the globalized world they want to go to nation state and and these are not only right wing politicians they are, they are also left wing politicians if you see in SPD uh, or, or in Britain Corbyn or in SPD uh, people like Volkan Strekov. So they, they recommend that nation state regain control on their borders and identity and social contract and so But I don't see this happening even in Germany because of technological and cultural change, that the states are not as they used to be in the past, that there are various other public actors which do they perform those functions which, which state used to. And, and, and states, for instance, lost control over, 
of a market's long time ago. I think the last politicians who tried to regain control on the national level of the markets was Francois Mitterrand. And uh, we know how it ended. After a few months, he said, OK, it doesn't work. 180% he turned the course. Yeah? And since then, there was nothing. Tony Blair said, you cannot beat them. We joined them. Yeah? So, and I see it now in the era of e internet, if, even more difficult to control those transnational transactions. Because before, in the era of Mitterrand, when internet was only beginning, if you wanted to, to cheat the fiscus, you had to travel with those, with those bags to Luxembourg or Switzerland or full of money, you know? And today, you don't even need to do this. You just do all the virtual transactions and, and most of, of, of the stock, uh, you don't even know who is the owner. So, so with all of those technological changes, it's much difficult for the state to perform traditional functions. So we have still democracy on nation states, but, but politicians can promise you many things about your pensions or, or, or other issues, but they cannot deliver because they don't control those transactions, yeah? So I believe that if you have, a, a, and, and cultural changes are also enormous. I mean, it, how many people want to die for their country any longer? I mean, there was, there was a, you know, when during the, the, the war in, in Donbass, in the tip top of the war, you know, Poles are very patriotic and anti-Russian and so, and they've met opinion polls. How many, what would you do if you are attacked by foreign country, which everybody knew Russia? <laughs> and most respondents said, we will flee to another country. <laughs> I think only 80% said we are going to resist. And it, it even, and it even makes sense because uh, technologically speaking, you know, you cannot really, re you know, resist uh, 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 invasions, which is either cyber attack or, or, or nuclear from space or so. This is not like an 18th or 19th century war where you can put people in uniforms with bayonets and, you know, and call Viva la France and go and 500,000 uh, are dead. And so you go back to the country and Viva la France and another 500,000 is ready. These times are gone, but our vocabulary has not changed. <laughs> on that and note, I from the story. France, by the way, but, uh, uh, but, but, but I think what I'm a little bit missing your story. I, wonder, I agree with your analysis, but I think it's far too negative. I think the main strength, now come to think of, of liberalism, is a story of progress. The whole idea of progress, which was, I think, essential to classical liberalism, liberalism was much more than just about individual uh, liberty. But I think this, there was a narrative of progress. I think that's what's missing now, is the lack of confidence and, and the lack of progress. I think and that's the most, most of the, the whole populism is about, it's a very negative, gloomy vision of the world which is being threatened, and it's a very negative vision. I think if, if liberalism wants to survive, it should go back to this uh, narrative of progress. And in many ways, things are getting better, and they should express that. And I think a story of a more optimistic story is far more forceful than the, 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 the somber, pessimistic, gloomy, uh, 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 cultural decline and decadence, and uh, we see with Trump, and well, we'll not mention the name Baudet, but uh, uh, it, it, it is, it, I think that's the main strength. And I think you're not using it enough. The whole story, uh, I think uh, uh, someone like Steven Pinker just got this book out, How Enlightenment, there is progress. If you're going to look at progress, I think that's the main, the main strength of liberalism, and that could be used much more, I would say. I haven't asked about maybe Mr. Bokersen wants to say something. No, no, no. At this moment, I, I, I would be at a loss to know what to say. Okay. Well, is the <laughs> there was one more here in the front. Um, I'm Enno Maassen. I'm at uh, the European Studies Department of the University of Amsterdam. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, well, I do have a question again about definitions and of clarification, because definitions are very important, of course, especially mm -hmm. talking about such, you know, like free-floating concepts as liberalism, and I would like to actually follow up on something that Matthijs mentioned, you know, that in the 19th century, strangely enough, uh, at least now it seems to us to be, uh, to be so, that you know, liberals were often also very much cosmopolitan and nationalist. So um, I do have a question uh, first to Mr. Bolkestein and maybe uh, Mr. Zilonga and, uh, and uh, Matthijs would also like to respond or, or, or add uh, uh, something to it. Um, well, you scrutinize liberalism and institutional liberalism, so I would like to ask 
um, to Mr. Bolkestein, would you resist against the idea of the fluidity of institutional liberalism? And um, is institutional liberalism essentially national or even nationalist? I, I know that um, liberalism in this country is represented by one political party, which happened to be mine. Uh, is that fluid? Um, it changes over time. Um, and it certainly is not now what it was when it was set up in 1947. Is that an answer to your question? Yes. Sure. Well, Should no. liberalism be national? Should liberal, what's the relation between national, nationalism and liberalism? The relationship between nationalism to you, and to you. Yeah. between nationalism and liberalism. Yes. There is no relation between the two. But institutional liberalism. So mm. well, well, what is institutional liberalism? It is liberalism as as represented by a political party. Mm -hmm. And in that case, I know which party that is. That's my party. But is that not is that is it that, that's not what you want to to know, or what is it? I mean, if that's your answer, so I mean, then I would say, then you know, like if we talk about the VVD, then you know, and you know, this is the representative of institutional liberalism yes. in the Netherlands and the sole representative of institutional liberalism, then you would say that is actually a national, uh, a national uh, phenomenon rather than it's being something beyond the Dutch uh, my national party, context. My party is a national party. Uh, and I don't think it has ever pretended to be something else but the national party. But there are liberal parties elsewhere, for example, in, in Germany and in, in Belgium. Um, yeah. okay. Can I just follow up on I that? I find this a very confusing discussion. I'm sorry to be so No, so, I mean, but uh, I, th I so think the, que the question would be, would it be possible to have a European liberalism? Well, and there is an attempt to have a European liberal party. In fact, the ALDE, A -L -D -E, uh, is a sort of a conglomerate of liberal parties and other parties that call themselves liberal, and it is functional in the European Parliament. But is it a true European party? No, it isn't. It's a collection of national parties. With the different national interests and also very different yes, understandings of, yes. of what it means yes, to indeed. be liberal. Yes, But can liberalism exist outside the nation state? Outside the nation state? Yeah, um, that, that's um, I, th I find that a difficult question. I don't think it will. I think it is. I, I have some difficulty in seeing liberalism outside or without nation states. Liberalism needs a nation state. Yeah. Uh, no, liberalism also is something people feel themselves. Uh, some people uh, are liberals, call themselves liberals, and, and, and have a liberal approach to political problems. So I'm not going to as it were, um, uh, restricts uh, liberalism to, uh, to, to states or to politicians, uh, uh, people in, the, in this room and, and, and here, and Mr. Zilonka s says that he is a liberal. So it, it, you cannot sort of pin liberalism down onto a, national, a nation state, in my view. Are there other questions? Because I think, you know, beyond the, def the definitions of liberalism, I think, you know, our concern is also with the counter-revolution, as Jan Zielonka terms it, and responses to it. Please. Geert uh, Ruijten. I worked at the Department of the University of Amsterdam. Uh, I have a very brief uh, comment on each of the speakers. Uh, first, Mr. Locke, you said that what was neglected was the distribution of wealth. But if you, but that's contrary to the facts. Uh, I mean, uh, in the United States, the 10% richest people own 80% 80% of the wealth. Within the OECD countries, the Netherlands ranks second with 70% for the richest 10%. So. And if you look throughout the 19th century, there hasn't been a, there has been a distribution of income, but not of wealth. Um, Mr. Bolkestein, uh, in your ideal liberal, because uh, you, you prefer to talk about uh, some ideal liberal, 
Um, well, free movement of ideas, free movement of, of commodities, of capital, but why not free movement of people? Can you be a consistent liberal with free movement of ideas, free movement of commodities, free movement of capital, but not free movement of people? Um, well, you talk about 90... I've not read your book. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, you consider uh, the period after 1989 and after. Um, I would think that in the, in the 19th century, uh, liberalism was... Uh, surely a progressive movement. But in the 20th century, uh, it has increasingly become uh, a movement of the status quo in the interests uh, of the upper class and those middle classes aspiring to become an upper class. And I th don't think that's something from after 1989. That's, that's what has happened throughout the 20th century and not at its end. Would you like to respond to the question of free movement, not just of goods and capital, but also free movement? Yes, indeed. <coughs> uh, 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 there's a, an agreement called the Schengen Agreement and it's intended to facilitate travel um, within the borders of the I, European I, Union. The world. I'm sorry? The, the global world. Not simply within, uh, you within and for You would like me European to say something citizens. about the global world? I, I, I want you to say that for a consistent liberal, uh, you can be liberal on the ideas that I mentioned, but not about free movement of people. Within Europe, we have no, free movement. Within Europe, we have well, free, free movement of people. Also. No, I think we have borders, and I want, would like to hang on to borders. And we have them for a reason. And the reason is that one country is unlike another country. So I think within Europe, we have freedom of movement, and that's called Schengen. Outside Europe is a different world. And I'm not dealing with people who come from outside. I don't, I don't, I don't talk about ideal liberals. I don't, I don't deal in ideal liberals. I deal with the world as it is. And if you, if you say that is not liberal, then you're free to do so. But I deal with the world as it is. I deal with realities. Jan, would you like to respond to the other question? <clears throat> I think we all try to deal with the world as it is, but we look at this world a little bit differently, what is clear in this discussion. And, and uh, <coughs> the idea of progress, I, I, you're absolutely right. And this is why I believe that intellectuals share the bulk of responsibility, because we actually don't have an idea how to remodel democracy, capitalism, or integration. We, we just, you know, intellectually can, can deal with small pieces of, of, of the puzzle. But we cannot, we, we are not in a position to go to electorate today in most of the countries to say that we have a workable system, let's, let's forget ethical system. Because if you believe, for instance, that the deal on refugees with Erdogan, forget about ethical, will, it sol will solve migration problem, fine. If you believe that the third three bailouts of Greece have solved debt problem in Europe, fine. Eh? 
But I just don't believe it will work. We have been, you know, for, for years may, paying off local warlords in North Africa and in other autocratic countries, and it, we never solved migration problem. So it is not only whether, whether and, and we now have Schengen Agreement, which, which we know that it didn't work, because the only person in 2015 who tried to stick to the Schengen uh, Agreement was Mr. Viktor Urban. But Mrs. Merkel realized that if she behaves like Mr. Urban, basically building concentration camps, yeah, and shooting those who, who pass the line, it would be rather uh, uncomfortable in historical terms. So this is, these, are, these are arrangements which we have, which we created. How workable they are? Well, forget about ethics if you don't want to talk about ethics. These are, these are the institutions we put in place. We also put in place monetary union, which, which basically, when, when the crisis, crisis started, we, we immediately it took national responsibility for, for, for debts of banks which were multinational. And then ask the, the taxpayer in all these countries to share the, show that the burden. And we are surprised that, that some countries like Greece, surprise, surprise, couldn't show that the responsibility. These are the institutions we created. I'm not finger pointing to anybody who was in charge of some of those things. But this is the real life. This is not the real life which we imagine. Hmm? And tell me what alternatives we have to propose to the Schengen system, which prove unworkable with the first shock we've got. Not the first, because we had similar shocks before. I remember 1991, Brindisi, when the Albanians were coming there. It was exactly like, scenes were exactly like in, in Kaleti Station in Budapest. Let's say what, what alternatives we have to, 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 this, to, to, to EMU system when the next crisis will happen. And all economies say that it will happen sooner or later. And this is when the institutions and legal arrangements are being tested, not when the good weather is around, when the bad weather comes. And do you believe we fix them? <coughs> well, if you believe that we fix them, good luck. Well, we, what we should do is not make it worse. Um, and Mr. Silonka, uh, you uh, say that we should reinvent European integration, and you want regions, cities, NGOs, and firms to play a meaningful institutional role in Europe. Well, let me tell you, that's a recipe for chaos. Well, uh, I think the chaos is is evolving in Europe created already. If this, what we have in Europe, is not a chaos, what is chaos? I'm sorry. We have different, I don't want to start new definition of chaos. <laughs> eh? But uh, if, if this is orderly, you know, uh, uh, thank you very much. So what response do we give to that chaos? Because no, I mean, the problem I, I of announcing chaos uh, is that exactly- this thing I can give you a very brief a, a summary of my previous book, when, when I basically said the story is like this. We came to the period of European integration, which was predicted already in the 50s by two theorists like Mitrani, that integration led solely by nation states come to the moment that you, in order to move further in functional integrations, states would have to dissolve themselves and delegate power to European center. And states are not going to do this, because they are gatekeepers and they are not going co to commit collective harakiri. And, but we all, and we see this, yeah? because with EMU, we, we hit the wall. We hit the wall, Everybody, even the Brits were saying you have to create not, ju uh, not just currency, but, but economic and fiscal government. But the debtor countries don't want to let the, 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 no, the but the creditor countries do not want the debtors to tell them what to do with their money. So they are not going to do that. But going back, as Brexit indicates, is a very painful process too. Because the only people who will earn any money on Brexit 
are those lawyers who will have to untangle 20,000 laws or regulations. So when you cannot go up and you cannot go down, go where? sideways. And what does it mean sideways? Break monopoly of states on integrations, allow other public actors to do certain things which they already do better than states. Uh, 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 do more functional integrations rather than territorial one and stop these fictions of building kind of federal state. And, 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 and st start doing decentralization rather than talking about this. And you know, so you can do this. But of course, if your world is only composed of nation states, nation states, you know, then we are not going to move anywhere. But in the European Union, as it happened, the only persons at the table are nation states. You know, some states like Cyprus or Latvia, compare them to cities like even Amsterdam. I'm not talking about Hamburg or, or Paris or London. I mean, those states are like those birds, you know. Some of them are like chicken, cannot even fly. We've had some interesting geographical metaphors. Um, we can have a kind of mental map of Europe, of states and the birds they resemble and liberal and illiberal tendencies. We're running out of time, but perhaps one more question. And perhaps since we've, you know, we haven't offered any solutions. <laughs> Mulling, I'm a TV audience analyst, and um, I also notice uh, myself in, when we have talk shows in the Netherlands uh, with uh, guests uh, that have some political ideas or with some race or with some um, sexual orientation, people tend even to get away. So I see a lot of uh, dissatisfaction in the Dutch TV audience as well. But um, my question actually to you, Professor Jan, is uh, we've talked a, little, a lot about, um, about liberalism. Is it dead in Europe? And uh, I wonder if you also would say, is it dead in the United States or is it dead in, in North America and Canada in general? <laughs> and if so, uh, why do you think uh, it, is also, it, it would be dead in the United States as well, where they don't have EMU or Schengen or, or European problems? But what problems would they have that might cause that liberalism is dead in the USA as well? And is there something in common or something different? What, what, are, what are the, com the common things in the between North America and Europe, and what are the differences? That's my question. Look, um, indeed, what is going on in America resembles a lot of problems we have in Europe. Again, in local variation, right? Uh, in terms of neoliberal economics, in terms of uh, 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 democratic institutions which basically increasingly shift decisions to bodies which are not elected, constitutional court. They don't have European Commission, but they have constitutional court, they have central banks which, which ca can take decisions and various regulatory agencies which take decisions away from the electorate, so to speak. And Trump is a response to some extent to this. But the re only reason I didn't write about uh, America is that I tried to stick to things I study regularly. Uh, I live in numerous European countries, read newspapers, watch televisions from those countries. America, I know as an as, as, as a ordinary newspaper as follower without studying in, in that. In fact, in recent years, I spent a lot of time in Asia Pacific and less time in America as before in the 80s. So I, I decided not to do this. It would boast sales of my books because there are a lot of people in America, you know, potential readers, but I, I decided that this is one bridge too far for an academic. I'm not a journalist and I have to stick to things I, I think I know because otherwise my colleagues would even uh, uh, crush me harder today than, than I have done so. But I think a lot of parallels are there. But you see, there are always those local variations. But I try to understand, to look at the forest. I don't look at trees. And this is my major misunderstanding with Mr. Borkenstein. For him, liberalists are just parties which call themselves liberals. And I believe that, that you know, this is a kind of bush within the forest. I try to see it in much more broader terms and you can find it not legitimate, but somebody has to do it too. And so I try to do this in the way I can. Uh, perfect, not, but let's have a discussion. Eh? And we had interesting discussion. 
So on that note, since we have to close, we haven't brought you any solutions, maybe more just a kind yeah. of uh, But let me an tell you of solutions. Of the Look, there is important things, and this is, you can say, a, 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 a weakness of liberalism. Liberalism is not about utopia. Is it about progress? It, as it's liberalism always believed that the process is as important as the product. And, 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 and so it is more about try and error. You need to have a sense of directions, and these are the liberal values we were talking about. But it is not about utopia. And this was the difference between Social Democrats adopted this policy, but, but communists already, or socialist pure, they were much more uh, about the end vision which we have to realize. And, and liberals always refused this. They were afraid of this. They believed that you have to try ideas and, and constantly negotiate with the electorate. Like, for instance, there is no a simple policy to solve migration, because if you read the Bible, you know migration was as long as humanity. But you always have to negotiate with the electorates the notions of opening or closing borders. It was always like this. And if you don't do this, so, so it's not like this that there is one simple idea which will solve the problem. No, you have to do it in various ways, but the notion of close and hard border is both ethical and, and not just functional. So, so this, because the, the definitions of the other is definition of who we are ourselves. So it is not only about what works, <coughs> it, but also how it changes us in the process of doing those things. So what I want to say is that this you can call liberalist weakness because it's not chasing, it is not chasing utopia. And therefore, it is not like this and you come here and one, two, three, which in television would be perfect if you have 30 seconds, one, two, three, these are my solutions, bingo. No, it doesn't work this way. And this you can say is the greatest weakness of liberal ideas but it, I believe it is also one of its strengths. But you have to stick to your principle. So no grand visions, but as you said, a slow and steady process and progress. Whether that will be enough to convince um, the voters. But we didn't even experiment. We didn't, everybody talks about taxing financial transactions and we never even started doing this. We only say what is impossible. And one day we have to start to, to say what is possible. And maybe we fail. The same on minimal wage. I last, this, last week we had a big fight in our college because my college doesn't want to subscribe to minimal wage in the 21st century. You know, and you can say this is a simple solution for complex problem of inequality. But how else we are going to, to, to move problems of inequality unless we start to do things which may, which, you know, which try to reverse the pendulum of, of, of which you described? We have to start doing those things. And sometimes there will be a price, but, but we don't try even. We just say, that's fine. And the populist wave just pass away. And in the meantime, they are winning more and more votes across Europe. I think in the end, liberalism will win because it is an optimistic story. And the main difference between counter-revolution and liberalism is, I think, the story of optimism and decline. That's the main difference. So what, the in, the what lies what in, in between? between. <laughs> what in between? I guess, you know, probably maybe by virtue of geographical provenance, and in this sense I agree with you, um, I think there is a geography of optimism and pessimism, and probably Jan and I come from probably. different geographies <laughs> that make us more pessimistic about Europe's futures. Thank you very much for your questions, for your comments, for your patience, and thanks especially very much to our commentators, to Jan especially, for providing the excuse for this discussion. Um, so thanks so much, and hopefully we can continue some of the discussion outside in the bar. Already there was one invitation of, you know, I'll talk to you. <laughs>
<laughs> the bars. <laughs> Thanks so much.